So we have a special part that I need you to do in this, in this last little piece that we're going to do here. And I'm going to give the choir a, spe a different part than they had in the first service just to make sure they're still awake. <laughs> but also because it really embodies what they embody, which is love. And so there are going to be three, three words that I'm going to need you to help me with. The choir is going to help me with the word love. And so is this section because it's Jesus' teachings on love that are the part of his tradition that we carry forward. So let's try it with these two sections. Let's try it. One, two, three. Love. Oh, no, we need more love than that in this world. Please. One, two, three. Love. That's better. Okay. Now, in the middle here, you are hope. Okay. So let's try that. One, two, three. Hope. Okay, we need a little more hope than that also. Okay, come on. One, two, three. Hope. All right. And then over here, you are community, because that is so essential in this particular world. Let's try that. One, two, three. Community. Oh, the community people have got it. Okay, we're good. It's good. There are two redwood trees in my backyard. And they're redwood trees who came to wonder during those many years of drought that we just came through. Does anyone remember that we used to have a drought? <laughs> These trees wondered why they lived so far away from the coast where there was the mist and the fog that they needed to survive. I saved bath water. I took fewer showers during those years. And a couple times a week, I would use the water I had saved to go out with my hose. It was the only thing I used my hose for to water down those trees. You know, they aren't supposed to be here, a friend of mine said. You might as well just let them die. But I kept using more gray water so I could dance with that hose around my trees. They'd been my friends, you see. And I was sad to think about waking up, looking out my window, and not seeing them. You know, we have these holidays and they mark many things. They mark year after year and for some among us they mark the change between this year and that. And for some people it's about not being with people they would have expected to be with or they'd been before with on holidays. I won't ask anyone out there if you've ever been sad because I know that everybody in their life has times when they're sad. But I will ask you to think for just a moment about a time when you have been sad or maybe afraid Maybe being sad and afraid, you see, is part of being human. And sometimes sadness is big. It's like the stone in the front of a cave. It blocks out all the sun and all the light. And in those times, it's very important to remember the stories that gave people courage and sustenance through the years. Because you see, even when we're sad, life has a way of going on. And the Easter story really is about the time of sadness after Jesus' death when his followers go back to their jobs, back to tending their animals and making food to one another and fishing out in the Sea of Galilee, hoping that it will give them enough bounty for them to live. For they were often the ones that were just above the margin. And it was Jesus' message that made them feel like they had worth and dignity, that they were important. But as they went about their days, their days were just a little bit slower. Their pace was just a little bit more deliberate. Life felt, felt a little fuller, a little more fragile, and a little unreal that all that they had worked for could be gone in this way. What was important to them seemed to have just vanished, and they knew it would never come back the way it had been. In the Seder dinner, too, the beautiful and bountiful Passover ritual, which this community celebrates here every year, the Jewish people remember that they were slaves in Egypt. They eat the bitter horseradish and the parsley dipped in the salty brine to represent tears. And they remember their sadness, that deep sadness, and they celebrate all that they have survived water turned to blood and biting insects and wild animals and being sick and boils and death of those near them and plagues and on and on and even frogs, which I never quite understand because I like frogs. <laughs> they, they understand all of that. 
And then they celebrate that they are still here, still strong, and still together. And we honor that wisdom from our Jewish ancestors who teach us that in hard times, when it seems as if misfortune may be your only guest, you need I think we need another chance at that. All right, let's try it again. Love, hope, community. Exactly. Now, of my two trees, the one that suffered the most was the one with the southernmost exposure. The needles became brittle and brown, and the ends of the branches curled down with discouragement. And I watched over time as the needles actually started to fall off, and the branches grew gray, and my heart felt heavy like that stone. The tree is dead, my friend said. Cut it down, at least the other one is probably going to make it. But I knew that the other tree was still okay and still green and still healthy because the dying one had protected it from the southern sun. Lose that one and the other one would soon follow, I knew, because together those two trees we're a very small community. Now, Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber came back to Christianity after a life of addiction and loss, and she says, I feel like the life of faith is the life of continual death and resurrection. Also, I think some sectors of Christianity think, well, you know, you're saved, and then you're good, right? And then you just lead a really nice life, and you're a good person, and you're redeemed, and you've kind of climbed this spiritual ladder, and you're close to God, and that has not been my experience, she says. <laughs> my experience is that disruption over and over again keeps happening, going along and then tripping over something that I think I know or I think I'm certain about and realizing that I'm wrong. Or maybe fighting to think that I'm right about something over and over again until I experience what I call a kind of divine heart transplant. <laughs> you know, it's like the life of faith reaches in, and the prophets speak of this. It is not, she says, a polite experience. <laughs> now, Jesus' followers are so sad in those days because it seems as if the political powers have taken away everything they have worked for, everything which was at the center of their dreams, everything that was making new meaning in their lives. And then it starts to happen, just bit by bit, on a road here or out on a boat there that they begin to realize that they remember the teachings and they realize that the teachings are not bound to the earthly form of their leader, but that they can remember them together. And that begins to renew their hope. The message, as our children sang, can still live and they can still live with, get ready, love, hope, community. Thank you. Now, all during the rains, I watched my friend, the southernmost redwood. The pounding drops remove the dead needles. The tree looks even more barren, more defeated. The northernmost redwood puts out green shoots on the branches, like new fingers reaching out to touch the spring. And I understand, and I accept that I've lost the battle for my friend. Much of the tree closest to the window has died. And I'm on sad, I'm sad, and on hard days, I don't even really want to look at that tree. Before the resurrection, there is the reality of the loss. And one writer pointed out recently that the Jewish story of Passover is that same story of loss, but it's written from the point of view of a community which reminds itself each year that the community is what helps it go on. And for, if you are a person who has suffered the kind of loss that that community faced and the threat of the kind of loss that they just bypassed, the loss of their firstborn, then you are never the same. The story of Jesus' death and betrayal is that story too, but written more from an individual's point of view. The Reverend John Shelby Spong says, we can think of the Easter story this way. What is it that you want to rise again? What is it that you would like to help resurrect? What is it that you are willing to commit and recommit to? Your own sense of peace or a sense of safety for all of our neighbors? Oh, yes, and... Love, hope, community. Which is at the core of our message.
and our interpretation of these stories. Because here is the thing. Those who experienced the teachings of the Jewish reformer Jesus of Nazareth found new ways to find hope, new ways to build community, new forms and in new places. And they found even new forms after his death. Those who awaited hope did not find it in the same form that they had found it before. It came up new like the phoenix. Change. We all need to remember that in times of change, hope will not look like the hope that we have lost, and still it will come back. We celebrate these holidays every year to remind ourselves to roll away the stones that block happiness from entering our lives, to roll away the stones that keep us from loving one another fully, to roll away the stones that keep us from understanding that we are, in fact, one community on this fragile and precious earth. We can be the ones to practice resurrection, that act of starting again when time seems hard and difficulties seem all around us. A few weeks ago, behind the tangle of green and deadened branches, I saw an improbable, giddy Easter green, and I went out to check out what was happening. There were shoots, little teeny shoots, just a few needles each coming out of the trunk of my southernmost tree. And a few weeks later, they are big shoots beginning to be new branches, all there amid the tangle of the old comes the new. My friend lives, and I am glad. So let us celebrate this time of rebirth, of commitment, of finding love and hope and community in its many forms. We know this rose will open, but let us today be glad for this day of hope and gladness. May we be the ones to make it so.